Hello and welcome to the Back to Space News Flash. I'm Danielle Dallas Russa. I know you're probably wondering who is that because she doesn't have bangs, but it is indeed I. A pin back. Cool stuff, guys. And don't go away because we have a giveaway of a lifetime. So make sure you stay tuned. Let's get started with Elon Musk's Cybertruck. We knew it was going to be unveiled this week and we were waiting. As I mentioned a couple of times, Elon said it looked nothing like that's ever existed and all the speculative rumors are indeed wrong. And boy, was he right. Here it is in all of its glory. Although in true Elon fashion, it was built to be cool and it was heavily influenced by the sports car slash submarine in The Spy Who Loved Me. And he mixed that with Americans' obsession with pickup trucks. He said, quote, we need sustainable energy now. If we don't have a pickup truck, we can't solve it. The top three selling vehicles in America are pickup trucks. To have sustainable energy, we have to have a pickup truck. Um, I don't know if it's because I live in LA, but I don't see any pickup trucks anywhere. This statistic shook me to my core. Um, and also, not, it's not just supposed to be cool, but it's also supposed to be bulletproof. Why? I do not know. So this is both hilarious and a little bit sad. The Tesla design head Frank von Holzenheiser, Holzenhausen, Holzhausen, Frank von Holzhausen threw a metal ball to demonstrate and prove how bulletproof it was. And its window just shattered. His response was, oh my but then Musk was like, um, it didn't go through the glass, so therefore I'm not wrong. It's bulletproof. So take that. Moving on to more SpaceX news, Starship Mark 1 had a pretty rough day this past Wednesday. The SpaceX Mars rocket prototype burst apart during a ground test, which is not great for our guy Elon. So basically these engineers were running a test on Wednesday that was meant to check how well the vehicle withstands high pressure, which is just like, you know, a little bit important. But then the metal cap on the top of the vehicle bust off. Pieces of aluminum were flying. Vapor spewed into the area and local SpaceX fans captured footage of the bulkhead landing nearby. It's not raining cats and dogs anymore. It's raining aluminum and vapor. You know what I'm saying? And then again, SpaceX came in being like, hang on, hold up, y'all. You're making this a bigger deal than it is. They said there were no injuries, nor is this a serious setback. The purpose of today's test was to pressurize system to the max. So the outcome was not completely unexpected. So pipe down, y'all. They got it under control. They're embracing this incident saying this is not a failure. Failures during testing has helped propel SpaceX to its crowning achievements. Could this mean that SpaceX will abandon the Starship Mark I prototype? Some SpaceX engineers have already started turning their focus to a newer test vehicular design named Mark III. Wow, harsh. Bye, Mark I. NASA has recruited some friends to help construct some lunar lander ideas for the Artemis program. On November 18th, NASA announced the selection of SpaceX, Blue Origin, Sierra Nevada Corp, also a great beer, Ceres Robotics, and Nano Satellite System Incorporated to join its Commercial Lunar Payload Services Program, CLPS. These five companies working together to deliver robotic payloads to the lunar surface for NASA, helping them pave the way for the return of astronauts to the moon by 2024. Quote, American aerospace companies of all sizes are joining the Artemis program. NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstine said during a statement, he continued to say, expanding the group of companies who are eligible to bid on sending payloads to the moon's surface drives innovation and reduces cost to NASA and American taxpayers. I love that. We anticipate opportunities to deliver a wide range of science and technology payloads to help make our vision for lunar exploration a reality and advance our goal of sending humans to explore Mars. NASA plans to spend a total of $2.6 billion on its CLS contracts through November 2028. Quote, buying rides in the moon to conduct science investigations and test new technology systems instead of owning the delivery systems enables NASA to do much more sooner and for less of a cost while being one of many customers on our commercial partners, Landers. NASA's Steve Clark, Deputy Associate Administrator for Exploration in the Science Directorate had said, he had said what? <laughs> now, moving on to some Boeing news. Boeing. Ah. On November 22nd, Boeing CST-100 Starliner spacecraft was transported from NASA KSC to a facility at Cape Canaveral Air Force Station. Then it was placed atop a United Launch Alliance 5 rocket of Boeing's uncrewed orbital flight test of the ISS. Phew, 
That was tough to say. The test, which is targeted for December 17th, will provide valuable data on the end-to-end -end performance of the rocket, spacecraft, and ground system, as well as in orbit and landing operations. This will all be used towards certification of Boeing's crew transportation system for carrying astronauts to and from the ISS. Cool. So this is a little late, but um, better late than never. On November 14th, Virgin Galactic kicked off Astronaut Readiness Program. This program is the process of preparing future astronaut customers for their flights to space. Since they are the only, first and only private company to put people into space in a vehicular built for commercial services, they are now finalizing all the elements of the customer experience, which, if you can recall, those super cool suits. So this program is led by Chief Astronaut Instructor Beth Moses and Chief Pilot Dave McKay. Health and fitness are important components of the space flight and part of their absolute commitment to safety. Virgin Galactic is proud to be opening space to more people than ever before while their future astronauts will not need to meet the incredibly rigorous levels of fitness required of government space agency astronauts. So guys, that does not mean you have to run a six minute mile to go to space, so I'm in. The past. On November 21st, 1676, the Danish astronomer Ole Romer discovered the speed of light accidentally. How does that happen, you might ask? Romer was taking advantage of the light, not studying it. He and his new telescope, <laughs> cute, he and his new telescope, well, they were just peering out into the moons of Jupiter, one of them being low. Just kidding, I.O. Io speeds around Jupiter in just under two Earth days, and Romer was hoping that the timing of Io's eclipse might help provide a tool for ocean navigation, of all things. Obviously, Romer wanted to be on time and peering through this telescope just as each eclipse started, but he noticed a funny thing. -da 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 -da. As one season set, there was a slight delay in the time the eclipse began. Happier later, all the eclipses were earlier than expected. Oh, was he calculating wrong? What? I don't calculate wrong. After he went through all this, he realized his calculations for the time periods of the eclipse were not off. He was right. Only one major factor was different. At one point of the year, the Earth was closer to Jupiter, and at another point, it was farther away. What is this made? I'm so confused. The orbit of the Earth spans a vast distance. Romer realized that the light from the Jupiter, the Jupiter, takes longer to get to Earth when it's farther away. He took a look at the time delay. There was about 22 minutes difference between the early and the late eclipse. Worked out the distance of the Earth's orbit and calculated the light must move at a rate of 131,000 miles per second. I was gonna say that because I obviously know all of that. This is not the correct speed of light, which goes at 186,000 miles per second, but it was definite proof that light traveled and it took some time to do so. <sighs> well, that's pretty cool. You know what? Because he discovered something that everyone was like, that's not real. It's not real. And he was like, wait guys, <laughs> it is. I know I'm not right about the exact calculations, but it is indeed true. Before we go any further, let's do the giveaway for this week. Ah, that sounds like a great idea. And before we do the giveaway, let's talk about this super cute photo that the sweet story bro sent, his signed picture with Charlie Duke, him and his wife. Can we talk about it? I love it, I love it. Okay, so guys, this is for the patch signed by the artist. Oh. And it is Matthew Geneva, Matthew Geneva. You won the patch, so amazing. This week, what we are giving away is something that really can change your life because it's coffee has changed mine. This week we are giving away a coffee mug thing. The technical term is a brushed steel insulated tumbler. If you want this, you leave a comment about your favorite private space company to, and why. Two, subscribe to this channel, and three, like this video. Okay guys, three easy steps. One, two, three. So let's go on to the future. Does anyone lay in bed at night and wonder how in the world we're gonna tackle the challenges posed by ocean worlds like Jupiter and Saturn moons? No, just me? Actually not really because NASA engineers are working on the underwater rover named Buoyant Rover for under ice exploration or for short, 
Brewy. And they've been working on it for a few years now, and they're taking it to test. The test will take place at Australia's Casey Research Station along the coast of Antarctica, far south of Australia, where Brewy will spend a month exploring both the ocean and the inland lakes. The rover focuses on where the top of the water meets the bottom of the ice. Quote, we found that life often lives at interfaces, both the sea bottom and the ice water interface at the top. Andy Klesch, leader of the Brewy Project, I don't know why I have to feel like I have to say brewy, like super cute, because it's cute. He said in this statement, quote, most submersibles have a challenging time investigating this area as ocean currents might cause them to crash or they would waste too much power maintaining this position. This brewy is designed to manage these challenges via buoyancy. It crawls along the bottom of the ice held up by the dense water below. The rover itself is a bar about three feet, one meter long, with a large wheel on each end for early tests, Rui will be exploring on its own. <laughs> He's so independent now. I thought he needed us. He will be tied to the ice to keep it from getting lost. But in the long run, the rover is designed to do more than just rove. It will also carry instruments, including two cameras and probes measuring factors like salinity, water temperature, pressure, oxygen levels. According to the statement, as I just mentioned, as data from Brewy's first excursion come back, scientists will determine when to begin adding instruments to the test. It's so cute, I'm so excited. I had about four more stories about the future, but I did this thing where I didn't hit save. And so you know what? You got it. You win some and you lose some. And I lost some. So we're going to move on. If you want to know more about the crowdfunding thing that we mentioned in the last video, it is in the, um, in the description of this video. But moving on. Student researcher of this week is Christopher Franklin. Here is a little bit about him. He interviewed Charlie Duke with Crystal in September. He has had five years in the Civil Air Patrol, recently earned the SPATS Award, and helped host the International Air Cadet Exchange. He has its private pilot license and working towards commercial pilot license. He went to space camp in 2016. He impaled an egg with a faulty model rocket. He's met seven astronauts, which is nothing compared to some of the other student ambassadors. I still think it's great. He was really into calisthenics, which um, is like body weight based like gymnastics. And he's headed into the Air Force or Navy to become a pilot. The dream for him is to one day become a test pilot. Good luck, Christopher. Got it. I believe in you. As Back to Space student ambassadors, we want to be prepared should we ever have the opportunity to fly into space. There is no difference between the ceiling and the floor. This is how we're preparing for that zero-G environment. That's it for this week's news. Alright guys, you want the tumbler? I know that you do. Who doesn't like coffee? People who don't like coffee are aliens. That's a new thing. Make sure you leave a comment about your favorite commercial space company and why. Make sure you like it and you subscribe so you can keep getting blasted by these terrible jokes every Monday morning. Bye guys.